This is Frank Islam, Chairman and CEO of FY Investment Group and your host of Washington Calling, where we interview leading voices from business and politics that impact you, the viewer. Today, we are fortunate to have a distinguished guest. His name is Sanja Hazarika. He's a well-known human rights activist, author of multiple books, and well-known policy expert and advisor for India's Northeast and migration issues. He's an award-winning journalist, he was formerly with the New York Times. Right now, he's international director of the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative. Welcome to our show, Sanj Sanjay. Good to see you. Thank you very much for coming to our show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're, you're most welcome. Please tell us who you are in your life journey for our audience. I know you have been a journalist, author, filmmaker, human rights campaigner, how do you balance all of these roles that you play? I'm, uh, you know, you're asking about life balance. It's, it's right. difficult, especially at the time of the pandemic. Uh, we have to do what we have to do in the circumstances that we have, that we live in as best as we can. And, uh, you know, our, our time is taken a lot. Uh, a lot of our time is taken up with issues relating to human rights and uh, uh, issues around that, whether it's media rights, freedom of expression, human defenders, um, custodial violence, issues like that, which are pretty grim. And this is a time when there are lots of restrictions on freedom of movement and assembly because of the pandemic. Yeah? So, uh, we do the best we can cross country. You know, we we have three offices in in India and in London and in Accra in Ghana. So I have to communicate all the time uh, with our, our teams. Right now, we are rapture on eight point seven uh, contemporary forms of slavery, modern modern day slavery, and uh, and human trafficking by the London office. So and I have to be constantly engaged on those issues. Yeah, so it's difficult. But this will be a good segue sorry. to talk about your current role as International Director of Commonwealth Human Rights. What are the issues that are concerning to you, alarming to you when it comes to India's human rights issue? Do you believe that India respects the human right? Yeah, I'm sure that uh, India respects human rights. It, it's a question of uh, not just the government. I, I meant the to say the current Indian India government. I meant, I meant to ask you, yeah, correct. I think the current Indian government has a very different view of human rights to what many of us understand it to be. And today, for instance, there was a, a discussion at the, at the Human Rights Council in Geneva, a side event on, on this very issue. Uh, because I think uh, that the, there are problems of prejudice and discrimination, which uh, are visible and I think the government needs to be much more proactive in dealing with these issues and not letting them slide. It can't be seen as siding with one side of the, of the one group or the other. And that is very important to stress, especially if you have a large majority. I mean, uh, you know, this, this is a problem which came up even, for instance, in the 70s when Mrs. Gandhi, Indira Gandhi was in power and she had a huge majority and she, you know, you know, really rough, rough short over the opposition. So it's important to be not just tolerant, but respectful of other points of view. And we're seeing a, a great, uh, there are many concerns about, about that because uh, we see uh, targeted, uh, um, shall we say, uh, uh, cases against uh, people from different groups. From so, so, so they're not, the government is not trying to bring the people together and embrace the diversity of India, which is the global beacon of hope for democracy and secularism around the globe. Well, I think it, it, is, it, is, it is a challenge. It is a okay. challenge for this government and it could do much more on the, uh, for instance, uh, mandated in rights 
recommended to make human rights and sub be proactive, but they're being very lethargic. They're not pushing uh, their uh, these concerns. They're not holding governments to account, not just one government, it's many governments. I want to talk to you a little bit about the Center for the Northeast Study and Policy Research, which uh, runs the board cleaning in Assam. If these are floating board clinics and who, yes. and tell us what kind of services do you provide? And do you provide free medication to these patients on the, on the boat that come to your uh, clinic? Yeah. See, this started as an idea, Frank. It started as an idea and an ex out, born out of an experience. I was traveling, I was making a film on the river, having traveled from Tibet to the Bay of Bengal. I was making a film about a segment of the river and we were traveling, my director and my crew and I were traveling on, uh, across the Brahmaputra to the biggest river island in the world. A young woman who died in childbirth in the hospital in time, she died on that ferry on the other, on the journey across. And uh, when we uh, got the story the next day, it was even much more tragic because she had a young woman in her teens, difficult pregnancy, carried to the, the ghat, the overnight in the damp and cold of winter next to this great river. And the next morning, they, they took the ferry, but it was too late for her. She passed away and, you know, she lost, you lost, you had two lives lost. Uh, a mother and an unborn child. And to me, it was an unacceptable situation. In, in my own home state, it's like this, and we pride ourselves on gender equality and the strength of So I did a bit of research, and I found that we had the highest maternal mortality ratio in India, 493 out of uh, 100,000 deliveries. And today, it's less than 200. And... Uh, and I did another bit of research and I found that 10% of the state, that's about 3 million people, live on islands. This is a phenomenon of the Brahmaputra. And there are 2,000 plus islands. So I said that we take the service to people, not people go for the service. That's the key. And health is at the heart of everything. So, but how do you do that? And then in conversations with people who live on the river, we came across, I developed the idea of the boat clinic. We competed for a World Bank award about rural marketplace and connecting uh, needs to services. And I floated the idea of a ship of hope in a valley of flood. It's a catchy title. I know I can give you a dozen catchy titles. You give me a minute. And that's how the story was born. And today we reach a quarter of a million people both clinics in 13 districts, and I have doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and uh, lab technicians and community workers. Yeah, and so it's... it's been how do you cope uh, with this clinic under the pandemic? And how do you sustain this project? Who pays for all these things? Besides the... You talked a little bit about the World Bank, something like that, didn't you? The World Bank gave enough money to build one boat. That was okay. 15 okay. years ago. Uh, okay. It wasn't no. It was just dollars, you know. So I built a boat, but then what do you do with it after? Right. So you scale up. You take a challenge. You scale up. You partner with the district administrations. They'd never heard of a PPP before. So <laughs> I said we'll have a private uh, public partnership. I'll design. I drew up the contracts. But okay. Then you can't sustain it with ad hoc national health mission okay. of the government of India. Okay. So they are funding everything from medicines to salaries to boat repairs. So that's been a sustained uh, and it's gone very well through the state government. That's one. Uh, the second is uh, as far as um, sustainability is concerned, we, we work with communities. So we inform the district administration the plan. You go to the communities. What are your priorities? You know, these are the things that we'd like to do. And in the pandemic, they've been active 24, not 24 seven, but they've been very active, uh, going, informing people, checking on issues of quarantine, seeing if there are any communities uh, or individuals affected because there's been a lot of back migration 
as a result of the shutdowns and the lockdowns. So they, they track individuals, they keep them informed, they keep the government informed, and the, they help the communities deal with this crisis. Thank you for your service, uh, for the ball clinic service to the humanity. Uh, my, uh, I also run a clinic in India in a city like Azam Girl, where I was born. And I understand the challenges that you're facing. Unfortunately, I'm funding it rather than the government is funding it, but uh, I will have to get some ideas from you. I want to talk a little bit about, about the significance of the Northeast to the India, the eight states that comprise it. What are the states that make it up? And I know you wrote a book on Northeast. Oh. And what kind of a challenge did they face besides discrimination, post-conflict trauma, or identity crisis? Well, the Northeast is a complex place. I, I like to call it Asia in miniature, where okay. uh, ethnic groups meet and mingle. We have communities that uh, are connected to Southeast Asia, have migrated there from there hundreds of years ago. There's one group which speaks Mon Khmer, which is Kampuchean. And if you go to my home state of, my home city of Shillong, you'll see signs which are in the Roman script, but you won't be able to understand what they say because it's actually Khmer, a form of the mountain Khmer that is spoken, Hilfa. And they moved a thousand years ago and more. So um, it's a complicated area with more than 260 ethnic groups. And uh, it's made more complicated by the fact that two thirds of the communities, a majority of the population lives in the and but two thirds of the land is controlled by one third of the population, which is basically a tribal Aboriginal right. uh, groups. And it was the area where the first uh, the first shots, the first challenge, armed challenge to the idea of India took place in the 50s by the Nagas, then followed 10 years later or so by the Mizos, then by, by Manipur, and in Assam especially. And it's been uh, a place where the Indian state has been uh, really tested uh, and has used uh, very draconian laws like the Armed Forces Special Powers Act to uh, try and control uh, communities which think differently, uh, uh, approach issues differently, uh, view each other differently. And uh, it was not a happy time, you know. Uh, we had 20 years of, of real bad conflict in which thousands of people were killed. Many more were displaced, at, uh, at, often at gunpoint. And there was a lot of sadness and grief. And uh, people are still dealing with that grief and sadness because there hasn't been uh, an organized way of counseling. You know, like you have people who come back from Iraq and Vietnam and from from them and from Afghanistan, they go through counseling for PTSS and PTSD. Right. This doesn't really happen. And people like when you go and do the filming and we go and interview people and have research, do research, you realize that people talk about things to you, complete strangers, uh, which they haven't told anybody in their family. And it's really very humbling uh, and very moving to find that you have their trust, that five-letter word of trust. And that's what also keeps the boat clinics going. People trust you. If people trust you, you can't let that down. You know, you have to be robust in your defense of them, in your advocacy for them. So, um, yeah, and uh, right now, situation, the situation is not of largely of conflict. It is, uh, the conflict has abated. The issues are still there. Right. But most of the armed groups are now in the process of dialogue. However fragile it may be, or these talks may be, they're still at the negotiating table or at least talking about something. We don't have any breakthrough. Well, that's a wonderful. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about your career, uh, your highlights of your career when you were the reporting for the New York Times. So. Tell us a little bit about that. And has it been changed since you quit New York Times? Yeah, my life has completely changed. I'm now I'm now a columnist. Okay. Uh, you know, I can pontificate <laughs> yes. on my views to the world. I couldn't pontificate when I was writing a you know, reporting unless I was doing analysis. 
So when I was with the New York Times, there were several high points. I mean, my trip, my first assignment was into Afghanistan when all the journalists got thrown out and I had a student passport. In those days, in the Indian passport, you used to write your profession. I was a student. So I used to go there and I spent two weeks, uh, you know, reporting on Afghanistan. I mean, I wrote the stories after I came back. You didn't have net internet at the time. Then, of course, I covered the war in Sri Lanka and uh, the civil war in uh, in uh, Nepal. And the, the fact that I was there when the monarchy announced that it was creating uh, a multi-party democracy. I was, and I had covered that. I went for a weekend and I stayed for three weeks. The Bhopal disaster, gas disaster, again, I right. went for a week, right. weekend and stayed for nearly a month. Um, and my own home area, I think I interpreted and reported on the Northeast uh, and the neighborhood as few New York Times uh, reporters had done, you know, traveling, whether it's the conflict and the migration issues or the insurgencies or land and flooding. You know, all these are issues that I, I covered and I, I'm very glad I did it because it gives, gave me an opportunity to uh, see the inner workings of a great newspaper and how, prior, how much of a priority they used to give to issues which many papers in India would not even look at. You know? That's a good way to put it. I want to change the subject and talk about, as you know, India touts itself the largest democracy in the world, and it is. But the pillar of democracy and the cornerstone of vibrant as well as a vital and healthy democracy is the freedom of press, freedom of expression, respect for human rights. So my question to you, what, what is your view of the press freedom of in today's India under this government? And what about the killing uh, that occurred to, uh, that killed several journalists? So tell us a little bit about your, uh, about your view of this government's view on the freedom of press. I can't, I can't speak for the government because the government uh, can speak for itself. My own view as far as FOE is concerned and freedom of the media is concerned, I mean, they're kind of interconnected, of course, is that uh, there is still freedom. There's still a lot of freedom, but these are under huge pressure. And uh, the kind of abuse and prejudice and trolling that you see, especially of women journalists, independent journalists, it is, it is not funny at all. And these are by bots and by armies of trolls and all that. And, uh, you know, there is a narrative which is uh, driven by uh, pro-government uh, groups, I think, which is uh, actually extremely challenging to the idea of freedom and balance because uh, freedom has its own duties and responsibilities, but there needs to be some sort of a balance as to your narrative. But in many of the big uh, news channels, you don't see that balance anymore. You see a complete rewriting of uh, uh, what a media is supposed to be doing. A media is supposed to challenge issues. A media is supposed to question government. You don't supposed to follow everything government says. You can follow, of course, a lot of things, but you don't have to be the trumpeter and the and the singer of praise and and be abusive of others. Uh, so I think that uh, the media, may, many media leaders or people in the media, especially the anchors and so on, have lost that uh, connect to what freedom of expression is all about. And uh, you have a situation where many uh, journalists are facing criminal charges, whether it's criminal defamation. Criminal defamation should be done away with. We, we don't, we, many countries have done away with it and India has retained it. The journalists who've been in the Northeast, for instance, who've been arrested under the National Security Act just because they were uh, critical or nasty towards the chief minister of a particular state. Uh, you know, and uh, it's uh, these slap cases which come, which really uh, demotivate people. So I think freedom of expression is there, freedom of movement, uh, freedom of uh, uh, the media to speak its mind is there, but that space is shrinking. 
and uh, you know uh, you can count on the fingers of your hand how many really independent uh, media houses are there whether it's print online or offline and broadcast and one of the really worrying things and i think it is something that's affecting media across the world is you need a new kind of model business model because the pandemic has shown those newspapers are going through the tube i mean the global economy it may be tanking or parts of it may be tanking and the media industry is tanking certainly people are being sacked people are being let go at very short notice this mm-hmm. has happened in this country and in many other countries mm-hmm. and why just talk about india for instance in pakistan the the publisher is senior one of the most senior editors has been in prison for nearly a month and uh, despite appeals as and for a 20 year old case really relating to property so similarly in bangladesh the digital security act is used to intimidate uh, arrest uh, harass journalists so it's not just here it's across the world across south asia wherever freedom of expression exists it is under pressure and we have to do everything you and i and many others to make sure that it not just survives but it uh, is robust and and uh, continues to speak its mind to the powerful and speak for the weak uh very well said uh, obviously uh, your points are well taken because there are a lot of uh, media organization in india they get funded by the ad by the government so the government has a somewhat uh, leverage on them in terms of the uh, fit, in terms of not being critical to the to the to the current government so which is a sort of a shameful but that's the way they that's the way it is and they they need to make a and that's the way it is but uh, but we will speak out and speak up and make sure that the freedom of press you know i think the the issue is not just one government it's been the the huge uh, revenue that comes from government advertising is something that every government the congress played that card uh, this government is playing its card other governments have played the cards especially at the state level we don't know what's happening at the state level at the central level at the metros you can make out and what we have in this country like in many other you have metro media which is not national media they represent the metros you know so yeah well thank you very much uh, sanjay for uh, for being an advocate for the human rights freedom of expression and and also what you do you're making a difference uh, not only in india but around the globe for being a spokesperson because you do care uh, about the self expression freedom of expression and human rights thank you very much for coming to our show this is frank islam wishing you great week thank you for watching Thank you.